uh, uh, particularly talk about, yeah, I'm going to specifically talk about implantable uh, neuromodulation for drug resistant epilepsy, just because if, probably if you look at the literature out there, there's a lot of these kind of case reports, case series, even of other types of neuromodulation therapies for epilepsy that are not implantable. So today's focus will really be on the implantable devices. Let me just make sure. So these are my disclosures. So the main thing is I, I did uh, receive um, um, a speaker's uh, fee uh, from Livanova when I gave a VNS related lecture, but this was donated fully to a charity. Uh, um, and so I, I didn't really uh, benefit from that myself. Okay, so here are my objectives today. Um, we're going to review three FDA-approved neuromodulation devices, implantable neuromodulation devices uh, for epilepsy. Uh, we'll talk about the potential mechanism and rationale for use, some of the evidence uh, available, and we will kind of go pros and cons uh, towards the end. Probably this is more for the discussion part uh, when I finish the, the talk. So first of all, we, we all of us here uh, attending this, probably the reason why we're even attending this is because we are working with uh, patients with epilepsy. Uh, and unfortunately, I mean, epilepsy is something that affects um, um, you know, up to 51 million uh, people worldwide. And recurrent unprovoked seizures uh, occur. Um, so in, in children, it's about one to 2% of children and the highest incidence is from first year of life and it kind of plateaus in early childhood and decreases after 10 years of age. But eventually uh, as the child becomes an adult, there is a second wave um, uh, in the older age. Up to 40% of patients um, can, um, will continue to have epilepsy or seizures, epileptic seizures, despite optimal medical management. So these are the patients where we already tried two, three different medications, either you know, in monotherapy or in combination, and they continue to have um, uh, uh, drug-resistant uh, seizures. And, and as we know, these are, um, the seizures are associated with um, morbidity and mortality. Um, you know, we all uh, know about SUDEP, uh, but there's also all these uh, poor health-related uh, quality of life uh, um, um, for, for these patients. And so for these patients, we try to work them up and, and see if we could improve their seizure um, control and potentially their outcomes. Um, and in doing so, we, based on history, really good history taking, knowing about the semiology of the, the patient's uh, seizures, and eventually doing our video EEG, our long-term uh, long monitoring, um, we might be able to identify patients who may have more focal epilepsy versus more generalized uh, type of uh, epilepsy. We also do neuroimaging, whether it's structural neuroimaging or functional neuroimaging studies to try to delineate this uh, further. But really looking at this algorithm, we do know that yes, in a selected um, series of patients, um, resective or ablative um, surgery uh, is highly effective uh, for these patients, especially if you have a clear uh, focus um, to, to take out and hopefully in a non-eloquent uh, cortex so that you won't uh, impose um, a significant uh, functional morbidity uh, on these patients. But then we, most of us also work with patients who unfortunately either we cannot lateralize or localize their seizures or we find different foci, more than two uh, foci. Um, and so, you know, what do we do uh, for these patients? So we try new medications. We try some research medications that are not really anti-epileptic medications or anti-seizure medications, but then are kind of repurposed. Um, so that, for example, uh, benfluramine. Um, we can also try ketogenic diet. There is also CBD. And we also think about um, devices that could be, you know, used to modulate uh, seizures. So in terms of FDA approved uh, uh, devices, we have three uh, devices that are uh, FDA approved. The, the longest, long, uh, the, the one with the longest uh, uh, amount of um, um, evidence is uh, for uh, VNS because this was approved back in 1997. So very long um, um, uh, uh, track record. Um, then in 2014, actually in end of 2013, there was a, a like a, a 
pre-marketing um, uh, approval by FDA, but the formal approval was in 2014 for RNS. Um, and then DBS uh, came on board for epilepsy in 2018. So I'm going to talk about these three devices in the sequence that they were uh, approved. But first of all, we, we want to have a basic concept of um, you know, neuromodulation. So what's, what's the reason to, to do uh, neuromodulation for these patients? So in, when I started training, and that was a long time ago <laughs> um, uh, in uh, doing my ep uh, epilepsy uh, fellowship, two different ep epilepsy fellowship in adult and pediatrics, we start thinking about, you know, is this patient a surgical candidate? We, we try to look for a focus and we think that if we can just take that out, that's great, patient will be seizure free. But the longer we all work in, in epilepsy, the more we realize that lesion is not always the reason for the seizure. Like there, there are other areas that um, um, might also produce seizures um, or maybe it's just hidden MRI negative or am I invis uh, invisible? Uh, but more and more, we realize that epilepsy is really a network problem, okay? So people think of this as more like a circuit uh, uh, problem. Um, and um, when we, we look at this, then we, we realize maybe we could try to modulate the circuit to make it kind of get back to more natural or normal uh, uh, circuitry. Um, and also, uh, with near modulation, you know, there are different targets that we could use. So for example, um, you know, it, with DBS, there are certain uh, uh, targets that are being used for, for um, uh, epilepsy. Um, and the rationale behind stimulating the actual area um, would be, you know, direct um, application of um, uh, stimulation uh, could potentially alter the tissue excitability, um, um, and also it can cause inhibitory effects, especially with higher frequency stimulation. Um, it can cause an inhibitory effect without causing functional uh, deficit. There's also uh, indirect stimulation with DBS, and even though we are directly stimulating a, a structure, we're not stimulating the area where seizure could be coming from, but we're um, simulating an area where it's like a hub where um, seizures might um, be affected that area. And that um, uh, area might have a lot of um, connectivity with other uh, structures that may be involved in seizure production. So in doing so, again, we try to interrupt or modulate uh, seizure activity. Um, Kind of similar concept with VNS, except you know, with VNS we are stimulating the nerve instead of you know directly stimulating a, a deeper brain structure. So same thing uh, as I mentioned. So with VNS again, we're not really stimulating um, a, a directly the brain structure, but we stimulate it indirectly through um, the the vagus nerve, um, and eventually um, uh, the nucleus tract is retired. And I'll show the the slide on this. Um, but anyway. The, the concept of um, DBS and potentially with RNS as well is, first of all, there could be a, an um, insertional effect. Uh, and this has been seen in, in, in patients with DBS where you insert the uh, electrode, um, you don't turn on the device yet, you know, you kind of wait a month and suddenly the patient be, becomes seizure free or their seizures dramatically reduce without even turning on the DBS. So there is that uh, insertional effect. It could last anywhere from uh, a few weeks. So, and the, I think the longest uh, was maybe two years. I think that patient was followed in uh, um, Toronto Western. Uh, they had published um, uh, that uh, uh, a case. Um, anyway, aside from the insertional effect, there could, uh, as mentioned, um, blockage of depolarization, um, and there would be some uh, some effect uh, in the neurotransmitter uh, level. Um, also. Um, there are some data out there, of course, this is more in animal studies where there might be um, um, changes in, in terms in, in the cellular level uh, and molecular level um, where there might be some neuroprotective um, mechanism involved with DBS um, and uh, RNS. Uh, but basically the stimulation usually uh, is using high frequency stimulation um, because um, it has been shown that high frequency stimulation can act as a reversible lesion. 
because you're using uh, electricity uh, to inhibit uh, uh, neurons uh, at the uh, near to stimulate uh, the electrode that's uh, the brain that's around the uh, stimulation electrode. So you disrupt seizure propagation um, and reduce this um, hypersynchronization of brain activity, which is what you know, in a very simple sense, what seizure is about. Um, and so you pre prevent the propagation of the uh, epileptic burst. In some cases, low frequency stimulation can also be used, uh, but um, especially in different targets, uh, sometimes low frequency stimulation can actually provoke seizures. So we just have to be careful uh, with that. So first let's uh, talk about VNS. So, when VNS was um, uh, initially, when people were, uh, were thinking about seizure, they, they, they felt that seizure might be due to alteration in, in, in cerebral blood flow. And in fact, in the 19th century, um, they thought by compressing the uh, carotid um, can uh, actually um, use as a therapeutic treatment for seizures. Um, so initially they thought it was more from um, blood flow, um, but actually when they're doing the carotid compression, that's where your, your vagus nerve is uh, as well. Um, and so probably what they're doing is almost like an external um, VNS. Um, and basically in 1938, there was a renewed interest again in electrical uh, VNS um, um, uh, vagal nerves uh, stimulation. Um, and they found in the 1960s that if you actually stimulate the vagus nerve at a very high frequency, so this is uh, different from DBS and RNS, so at 70 hertz or higher, you can actually cause synchronization, so seizures, uh, whereas um, lower than 70 hertz, you, you produce EEG desynchronization. Uh, the first VNS in, uh, implant in a human was um, back in 1988. Um, this was in... Uh, um, in North Carolina. So, you know, as, as I mentioned, you know, VNS has been approved for a very long time. Um, it, it, it's now, uh, since 2017, uh, it has been approved in children as young as four years of age. But as we know, with many centers um, in North America and across the world, um, there are much younger children also getting a VNS um, uh, implant. I mean, I think the only thing will be more from a surgical um, um, limitation. It's like, like places that don't do uh, very young children, it's probably more um, surgical technique rather than um, not, um, not VNS not being uh, useful for, for younger children. Um, and um, maybe this uh, number is already, I'm sure it's way more because this is from 2018. There are more than 100,000 devices uh, implanted uh, worldwide. Um, and we can program many things. And the other thing with the VNS is there is a magnet that can be used to um, activate the device um, to uh, give extra stimulation um, on top of the regular uh, simulation. So when people are thinking about uh, how VNS works, so in, the an in animal uh, models, uh, it has been shown um, that the locus reus is a very important structure um, for VNS to work because uh, when they try to do a lesion of uh, the locus reus, um, either um, uh, surgically or you know using uh, chemicals, the the VNS does not work anymore in uh, in in controlling um, seizure activity. So that was the initial um, thing: is that locus reus is a very important structure. But this is a nice paper. Um, from uh, Dr. Ibrahim, George Ibrahim's lab um, um, that talked about the vagus uh, afferent network. Um, and basically you can see in this uh, very nice figure, so this is the vagal nerve. Um, so yes, the, there's a nucleus tractus solitarius, the locus series. These are some of the key um, uh, structures that are um, modulated. Uh, and, and from these structures, there are, there's uh, all these connectivity in other areas of the brain that are usually involved um, in seizure production. So as you can see, it does, the VNS also can modulate areas in the thalamus, but I think one of the important uh, take home uh, for, for VNS is that yes, you can modulate all these different areas, but VNS is not specific. It won't give more stimulation to one 
or the other area, let's say if your seizures are mostly coming from the prefrontal cortex, VNS is not going to deliver more current in that area. It's just this whole area is modulated. The same, same amount of modulation is going through, as long as, of course, your, all your structures are intact. There, um, so the VNS uh, devices have sort of uh, improved over time. It has gotten smaller. Uh, this is not to scale. Um, but anyway, the newest model out there, uh, which is Centiva, um, that was uh, FDA approved in 2017 and pretty much is the device that's being um, implanted um, here in, in Canada and, and probably most uh, centers as well, um, has all the, the extra features of the um, Aspire SR. So these two devices have this make this device more of a closed loop device because you have the tachycardia um, and you can use tachycardia as a surrogate for possible seizures. And the, this device would deliver extra current. Uh, on top of that, the Centiva device also has uh, have, has other uh, extra features, including um, being able to have like a morning and evening um, mode of simulation. You can have two different modes of stimulation. Uh, also, you can have use the pre-scheduled titration uh, so that especially, you know, when COVID happened, um, we didn't want patients to come to clinic all the time. So you can potentially um, put in a pre-scheduled uh, uh, up titration uh, so that you don't have to see the patient so often. And also there is the bradycardia detection uh, that is in this device, although it's not really doing anything except just having the detection. Uh, maybe future models might make use of, of this, but at this point, the this is just something that it's um, the the device is um, getting information on. So yeah, this is to scale, uh, and you can see if I I have my debit card here, but I covered my numbers, so you won't see that. Uh, but you can see um, the size of the Aspire SR, um, and now the Centiva, which is what um, most centers are using. So. Um, you know the 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 AAN had as uh, have as um, published evidence uh, based uh, guidelines. Uh, this is an update uh, to include uh, pediatric patients, uh, but um, you know VNS does um, uh, improve seizures in terms of in, um, reducing the severity of seizures and also reducing the number uh, of seizures. Now. This is from a more recent paper in uh, 2021. Um, this is like a, a using a meta-analysis of a lot of prospective and randomized control trials. So they didn't include studies that are like, you know, retrospective case series and, and all that. And that's why they, they, it's a limited number of uh, studies. And this is also limited to adult patients, okay? Um, so, all these studies, the sample size is anywhere from 20 uh, to 332 patients. And the follow-up duration, um, unfortunately, most of these RCTs and prospective uh, case series for VNS um, are not very, very long-term uh, outcomes. They only have like some studies, there's a study that goes all the way to 60 months, but really most studies are kind of short-term um, up to like 1.3 years is the mean. So the responder rate, there is a, a, a variability between, uh, so when we talk about response rate or responder rate, these are patients who have 50% or more reduction in the number of seizures. You know, some patients might be seizure free, but you know, basically we just use 50% or more reduction as the, uh, when we, we talk about responder rate. So Again, there is variability anywhere from 11% to 71%. Uh, but um, putting all of these uh, patients together, the mean percentage in um, seizure, a reduction of seizure frequency is about 34%. Um, and the proportion of patients who had seizure freedom, so you know, um, uh, ILAE class one um, is up to 8%. But most of the studies, as you can see uh, here, um, either they didn't report it or very low to none, no, no patients with uh, becoming seizure free. Okay, so, but the seizure um, outcome, we, we, when we talk about VNS, it's more than just seizure outcome. We also talk about improvement in, in quality of life and social functioning. Uh, and, and there are many papers out there. I just have this one um, and 
um, because it, they followed patients up to three years after implant in VNS to show in terms of healthcare dollars. Um, so the longer patient had the VNS, there is you know reduced amount of uh, healthcare dollars needed uh, just because their seizures improve. Okay. Um, uh, as I mentioned, so VNS uh, is something that is programmable. You have three different modes of stimulation. Um, there is the regular on and off cycle, which is the normal mode stimulation. Um, the magnet mode stimulation is when the patient uses the magnet to uh, trigger an extra or stronger stimulation um, in response to a, a clinically evident uh, seizure. But there's also the automatic stimulation or auto stim, um, and this is in response to an increase in heart rate. It has been shown that up to 82% of patients with epilepsy can have tachycardia uh, in relation to the seizure, some at the beginning of the seizure, some in the middle of the seizure. So when the VNS detects that, uh, it can uh, um, deliver an extra current. And there are papers out there. So this is in adult patients, and this is um, we published this uh, from our um, uh, sick kids um, uh, cohort, where uh, patients after they had the older device, so the ones without auto stimulation um, um, switch to a newer device because the, the battery was um, uh, depleted with the older device. There was a, uh, there is also an improvement um, showing that the auto stim had given a, additional benefit uh, in terms of seizure control. So when we uh, dose up the patient, so there's the phase one and phase two. Phase one, you kind of just go up by, you know, 0.25. With the newer models, we can go half step, like 0.125 milliamp. Uh, and, 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 and every center is a little bit different. Some centers might do it like every two weeks or every week or every month. Um, so there's no standard protocol. Uh, for, for people to, to do, but, you know, it, it really depends. I, I tend to use every two weeks, um, especially now with the newer model where I can do pre-scheduled up titration. So when I'm doing phase one, I, I use every two weeks also to have patient kind of get used to the simulation to uh, avoid the side effect. Once you get to about 1.5 uh, milliamp, then you go to phase two, you start um, uh, playing around with the duty cycle. And, and so there is this nice table uh, showing uh, what we mean by duty cycle. So when, we, when let's say I said duty cycle of 10, it means patient um, is getting um, stimulation of 30 seconds every five minutes. So off for five minutes, on for 30 seconds. So you can start kind of going up on your duty cycle once you, you get past uh, phase one dosing. And the nice thing, as I said, with the newer model of VNS is that um, you can actually do this scheduled uh, up titration. You, you can do every two weeks or every week, whatever you want. And also the, the good thing with, with the VNS is it's, it's much simpler to, to, um, to uh, program. So you need, of course you need some training, but the, um, now more and more uh, neurologists working in the community are getting comfortable um, programming VNS because again, there is this, you know, pre-scheduled and they actually have these paradigms where you can just click and it'll just do it for you, right? So th there's not a lot of uh, tweaking to do. Uh, but of course, once you get to the duty cycle part, you know, in phase two, you, you probably need a little bit of help from your colleagues who are in the, the um, um, uh, epilepsy uh, centers. But otherwise, you know, for the initial up titration, you know, a, a community neurologist with training and support, uh, sometimes Libanova reps would also help uh, support uh, the physician uh, can, can do this. Um, when we try to diminish uh, side effects, um, basically there is, these, these are the recommendation. I'm not going to go through that in interest of time, um, but you know, you have this recorded so you can um, have a look at, at, at this. So there are these uh, common uh, side effects. But one of the thing um, we've noted more and more now, so this was initially more in adult population because yes, there are many adult patients uh, with epilepsy who also have sleep apnea. And it has been proven that, you know, um, patients who already have obstructive sleep apnea could potentially have worsening of their sleep apnea with VNS. Um, and, and so this is the, uh, in that paper they showed, you know, when the VNS went on and off, they, they were able to, to see that. Um, and they can see there is actually um, a, a hypopnea uh, happening and also some DSATs 
happening. So this is uh, something important uh, to note, because as you know, when patients um, would always say, sometimes their seizures actually also worsen. And if you're not getting improvement of your seizures in patient with VNS, you might want to um, uh, check on this and make sure um, uh, that the VNS was actually not contributing to a worsening of OSA. And if that's the case, especially if the patient has the newest device, the Centiva device, you could potentially tweak the evening uh, dosing uh, to hopefully uh, reduce this. We've seen this in children as well. So um, in fact, this is one of our patient uh, at sick kids who had actually, um, uh, who had already pre-existing OSA, but at that time, I wasn't asking these questions when I was doing my consult, um, but this patient actually had worsening of, uh, of um, uh, OSA because he, he was admitted uh, after the implant and we noted the DSAT because we turned on the device right away um, uh, in, in, in our case. And, and so eventually this patient uh, had consult with respirology and was able to use a CPAP machine. So we were able to continue up titrating uh, the VNS for this child. Uh, in terms of um, patient selection, um, it's just there's so many articles out there saying, oh, this type of seizure, uh, it would work better and, and not, uh, but it's not really consistent. But I think our experience at SickKids, and I, actually this is an, a paper that was published in, in Japan by uh, one of our uh, former uh, research fellow um, at SickKids as well, uh, two of them actually, um, they published a, a patients with um, either epileptic spasm or tonic spasm versus those with kind of partial seizures or with uh, secondary uh, or bilateral tonic-clonic uh, seizures. Um, they followed these patients for two years uh, after VNS was implanted. And what they've noted is that those patients with epileptic spasms or tonic spasms, they don't tend to improve as much compared to uh, patients with um, the, uh, the um, partial seizure or um, uh, secondary generalized uh, seizure. So as you can see, none of the patients in, in this group actually had McHugh 1 plus 1, which is like 80 to 100% uh, reduction in seizure uh, frequency. Um, you have some with um, the partial seizure group and in fact improve even more um, by the second year. So there's not significant um, improvement uh, for this group of patients. So we, we're also seeing that more and more in, in our uh, patient population. But as you know, before DBS and RNS became available, VNS was the only game in town. So at that time, of course, we implant VNS for these patients who are not surgical candidates. Um, so this is what I was mentioning. Um, this is another paper that came out from uh, Dr. Ibrahim's lab, um, his, his, his uh, team. Um, they looked at many, um, they kind of did a meta-analysis of many uh, studies out there, looking at seizure types or EEG, having a family history of seizure, you know, age, um, which model of VNS, uh, and to see responder versus not non-responder. So there's really not a, a tight correlation. So you can't say, okay, this would work, this won't work. Um, and as we know, all these devices are, are costly. And you know, even though this is the least invasive amongst the three uh, devices, um, we still have to you know, make sure that uh, you know, we, we're choosing the right device for the right patient. So, in his his team also looked at um, uh, using um, multimodal uh, connectomics, and what they've noted is that patients with um, higher connectivity actually had um, um, these are uh, the patients who tend to be responders. Oh, but of course, the this this is a study um, that's retrospective as well. Um, also uh, from Again, from Dr. Ibrahim's lab, um, they use SEF. So this is somatosensory evoked field um, using MEG uh, as a potential uh, biomarker. So they, they use the MEG data from patients who had their pre-surgical evaluation before they got the VNS implanted. Um, and when, when they look at um, this data, um, what they've noted is that those um, with um, the responders to VNS uh, are patients, again, with more widespread uh, SEF localization. So um, kind of showing that significantly greater functional connectivity um, um, uh, in, in these patients. Uh, these are the patients who tend to 
have a better response to VNS. So potentially this could be used as a pre-implant marker when you're trying to select patients who may or may not um, be a candidate for VNS. Um, there are other many other papers out there uh, looking at different biomarkers, but really the, the, the take home message for, for all these papers is that the more deviation you have from a normal brain, um, whether it's structurally or you know, connectivity wise, more deviation, worse outcome. So that's that's the the bottom line. So now let's let's move on to RNS. I only have a few slides here because I'm. This is basically from all my readings because I have no experience with RNS. But as you know, RNS is only available in the U.S., not anywhere else. Um, and and this was approved back in 2014 for adult patients with drug resistant epilepsy, and they have to have one or two, the, a maximum of two um, uh, epileptic foci. Um, and this provides a closed loop uh, stimulation um, when an abnormal ECOG is uh, seen or detected, it would then uh, give a stimulation in an attempt to stop or uh, um, uh, desynchronize that activity. And it is cranially implanted. So you have um, two electrodes, you can have a combination of either two depths or one depth and one strip or two strips. So, and actually you can implant up to four, four leads, okay? But only two can be connected at a time. I mean, I guess, unless you put in two uh, different generators. So one generator can only um, uh, take care of two uh, electrodes. Um, and basically this is a much more personalized um, uh, um, uh, device because you try to use the patient's EEG or ECOG to um, um, then uh, make your uh, stimulation paradigm uh, for these patients. Um, so this is just a, um, um, what I'm um, uh, showing. So it does record ECOG, but it's not continuously recording ECOG. Actually only the uh, times where there is, well, the seizure or maybe like increase, you can uh, manipulate that, uh, program that, uh, it will only save those segments. So the interictal, like long periods of interictal activity is not going to be saving that uh, uh, ECOG. Um, and um, in terms of uh, clinical trials, so really um, it the, uh, Pivotal uh, trial um, was what really uh, pushed FDA to ha have a very quick uh, approval of this device uh, because it did show um, really um, uh, good outcomes. And this, um, there is now up to nine years of uh, data, uh, which um, um, actually has more than 1,895 patient implantation a year. Um, of uh, data, um, and they have up to 73% responders, again, 50% or more reduction in seizures. Um, and um, actually, out of these responders, 35% had um, more than 90%, uh, this should be percent, uh, seizure-free uh, uh, reduction. Um, and um, some patients, a, 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 a big number of patients actually also become seizure-free um, uh, with this device. So there are um, uh, potential side effects. The battery life uh, is about 3.5 years, but with the newest uh, model out there, uh, it could be up to eight years. So this is from all, from all my readings, this is like the stimulation parameter. So it's not a direct uh, continuous stimulation. Basically when it detects the ECOG abnormality, it will give two bursts um, of stimulation and each burst is about 100 millisecond uh, with a stimulation frequency of uh, between 100 to 200 Hertz. Um, and then it depends on the type of stimulation if you're doing monopolar or bipolar, um, basically you're trying to have a, um, a to, to get a charge density and this is the, the charge density um, that they, they uh, recommend. Okay, so this is from the RNS, uh, the NearPace uh, website uh, showing uh, what to do with each uh, visit. Um, and as I mentioned, like it really depends on what sort of electrodes you're using. Um, there might be different um, ways of programming. It's a little bit more complicated uh, programming compared to VNS, as you can see. And, and they also have um, different recommended electrodes or combination of electrodes to use, depending on what type of patients you have. You know, if you have patients with bilateral mesial temporal lobe uh, epilepsy, 
um, then you use this type of uh, depth electrode versus those with more um, cortical or neocortical um, uh, onset, you use more of a strip electrode or you can use a combination. Um, there are many studies looking at biomarkers, but this was the, the paper that actually looked at pre-implantation biomarker. Of course, they, they did this after the patient already got the implant, but they, they look now at the intracranial EEG of these patients before um, they got the RNS. And what they've noted um, is that um, patients who have higher, um, high gamma band um, uh, synchronous, uh, synchronizability, a very long word, um, this uh, can distinguish between those who have good response versus not so good response with RNS. Um, and uh, what they saw is that um, high gamma synchronizability is inversely associated with the degree of uh, therapeutic uh, response. So they're saying they need more data, of course, but they're uh, trying to um, um, show that this could be a potential marker, biomarker, uh, when you're trying to choose a patient if they're going to respond to RNS or not. Now, um, quickly, let's go to DBS. So DBS has been used in movement disorder for a long time. Again, you know, ablation, um, uh, the the, um, the uh, study um, uh, in 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 DB um, in movement disorder is really neuroablation uh, treatment and subsequently using electrical uh, stimulation to to do this ablation. Um, eventually, in 2018, so the, the Sante trial uh, has been going on for many years, but uh, subsequently, after they also showed their long-term uh, uh, outcomes, in 2018, FDA approval was given uh, to DBS for epilepsy. So there are many devices um, out there. This um, was a device that has uh, that's uh, rechargeable, so it has very long battery life, 15 years. Um, but the current uh, model that's being used for uh, epilepsy, and I, I believe also for movement disorder, is a uh, percept uh, device. So this has the advantage of having brain sense. So basically, it use uh, it can record local field potential uh, in the uh, electrodes that you use to um, uh, record from the thalamus, um, and it doesn't do anything yet to those um, information, but. Perhaps the newer model, once newer model come out, might be able to use those um, to help tweak the device and maybe even make this into a closed loop stimulation. But right now, DBS is an open loop uh, device because it, it, it just kind of go, either you have a duty cycle, you know, on off duty cycle. In the Sante trial, they were using one minute on, uh, five minutes off. Um, there was no big reason why they chose that except to save battery life. Um, but our uh, experience at Sick Kids when we were uh, doing DBS, we were using continuous stimulation, not um, 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 uh, um, no. There's no duty cycle. Basically, it's continuous, right? So this is um, uh, what I was mentioning. So brain sense would be able to kind of pick up um, the seizure. Of course, the the patient can mark the seizure, and then you can see where they mark the seizure is see if there is a change in the local field potential. So again, in the future, maybe newer models might be able to use this to deliver maybe extra current. Um, there are many targets for DBS, um, but the, the two that I will quickly mention will be the ANT, the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, and the central medial nucleus of the thalamus, because these are the two with the most uh, robust data. So ANT, uh, the rationale is that it is very tightly uh, connected to the PAPES circuit, um, and so especially patients with temporal lobe epilepsy um, and maybe some frontal lobe epilepsy uh, would be uh, the best responder for this target. Um, so in targeting uh, the electrode, this is more for surgeons. Um, there are many papers um, telling, you know, which area of the ANT to target to get the best uh, response. Um, and this is, um, you know, a picture from the Sante trial where, where they, which, uh, where they mentioned th this area is the, the area to, to put your electrode on with the best um, uh, patient outcome. So this is uh, more from multi-center, but more like European uh, cohort, uh, again, showing that um, the placement of electrode is very, very important um, in terms of, you know, having patient who may or may not respond um, as well to, to a, uh, ANT DBS. 
So I'm just going to talk about these two papers because this is from the Sante trial with a longer, um, uh, the initial trial as well as the long-term uh, outcome. So with the initial uh, Sante trial, what they did um, was um, after uh, implantation, they didn't turn on the device right away. So after, it was um, one month after when they start to randomize the patient. So, uh, I mean, they randomized the patient and after one month, one group had stimulation and then the other group did not have stimulation. So it's interesting, as you can see, all of them after implant, there is a significant reduction in their seizure. So this is the implantation effect that I was mentioning. Uh, but then over time, those who are in the treatment group continue to have improvement in their seizure, so reduction in their seizure, whereas those without uh, when the device was not switched on, um, uh, their seizure started to creep up. But then over time, after the, the initial um, uh, blinded uh, 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 time, then all patients eventually got the simulation. And so they have seizure outcomes up to five years. Um, you can see the corresponding uh, res responder rate. So, you know, it, it improved from 43 to 68% by the time that they are into five-year uh, mark. Uh, and as I said, you know, the patients who had the most improvement seem to be the, temp the temporal lobe uh, epilepsy group. And they have now data up to 10 years. Again, you know, you can see um, there is uh, continued improvement in, in, in uh, response rate, okay? Um, there's also improvement in quality of life uh, because there's improve, improvement in the seizure um, uh, severity. So these are the uh, adverse uh, outcomes uh, that they've uh, uh, noted. So I'm, I've listed them here. Um, in, in terms of uh, SUDEP, they had four uh, patients with um, possible or uh, a probable or, to, or um, uh, um, real SUDEP uh, in out of the seven deaths in this uh, long-term uh, follow-up. There's also, so one of the thing with DBS is a lot of the patients did complain of mood problems and memory problems, but when they did more um, uh, objective uh, measures, there's actually no significant decline um, uh, in uh, cognitive uh, uh, decline or, or depression uh, score. So it's what the patient feel, but when they do, did it more objectively, there's actually not a significant um, uh, difference. So. Our experience with uh, DBS at, at Sick Kids uh, was with this child. This was our first uh, patient who got central median nucleus of the thalamus um, uh, DBS. So the CM, uh, the, the central median nucleus is actually the largest interlaminal uh, thalamic nuclei. Um, and the rationale behind using the CMNT um, uh, 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 for um, DBS as a DBS target is that um, it's been known, and this is in, in animal studies, uh, it has been shown that when they did low frequency simulation of this, they can actually produce um, EEG that's almost similar to uh, an absence uh, epilepsy. Uh, but then when they use um, higher uh, frequency stimulation, um, this uh, EEG uh, finding um, disappears. So it's, it's a treatment for patients with generalized type of seizure, whether it's a genetic generalized epilepsy, or we've used this a lot in patients with Lennox-Gastro uh, patients as well. Okay, um, so this is just uh, talking about the surgical approach um, and what you could potentially see uh, on using scalp EEG during um, uh, implantation. So this is what we do uh, at Sick Kids uh, when we do the implant. We also have scalp EEG to see you know, when we switch on the device, we can see some changes on the EEG to kind of know we are in the right place. Um, this is a nice uh, uh, systematic review of uh, DBS in children. And uh, that was also um, from uh, Dr. Ibrahim's group. Um, and as you can see, majority of patients actually had uh, CMNT um, uh, implant. And, and outcomes are, are variable, but most of the outcomes are good, especially for uh, patients with uh, the Lennox-Gastaut uh, type of uh, uh, seizure or generalized type of uh, seizure. Um, so this is more in adult population. Again, um, patients with generalized epilepsy uh, or you know poorly localized uh, epilepsy. Uh, what they've noted is you know a continuous improvement, uh, um, seizure uh, frequency reduction uh, in the patients as they uh, follow the patients along. Um, this is an ESTO uh, trial. Uh, so this is electrical stimulation of the thalamus 
um, basically this uh, central median nucleus of the thalamus uh, for Lenoscasto uh, patients. So this is more adult uh, based, although there are a few uh, pediatric patients. And again, um, th what they've seen is an improvement, not just in clinical seizure, but they also have EEG. So it's interesting that when patient report their seizure, it seems to be variable here. I mean, there is improvement in the treatment group, but when they look at actual EEG recording, um, it's actually a significant improvement in seizures. Um, side effects are quite, um, um, I mean, it's not very common, but some of the, the um, unintended uh, aggressive behavior, we've seen it in, in uh, our patients uh, at, at sick kids with the CMNT um, simulation, and we uh, kind of published this. So there are many um, electrical stimulation configuration that you can do. You can do unipolar, bipolar, double unipolar, or even uh, interleaving um, uh, stimulation because we implant two electrodes. Um, I think at sick kids, uh, most of our patients are using the double unipolar um, uh, stimulation. And the advantage of using the kind of unipolar uh, simulation is that even if um, your if your electrode is not quite where you are, but because you have this kind of wider um, uh, stimulation, you could still maybe stimulate that area. Uh, but then it comes with a bit more side effects because you're you're kind of doing it this way. Um, but I think the newer implants now at SickKids is using uh, directional um, uh, electrodes. So you can see, you can actually stimulate just here or here instead of giving this whole thing. So potentially can reduce uh, side effects as well. This is the um, for um, ANT DBS dosing. Uh, um, and this uh, came from uh, Dr. Fasano's uh, group. Um, uh, well, it's a multi-center uh, um, uh, collaboration, uh, but Dr. Fasano is the, the main uh, author for this, uh, uh, talking about how to um, uh, dose up the patient's uh, DBS if you have the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, but you could potentially use similar uh, setup for uh, CMT um, uh, dose titration. So this is just showing you the um, uh, stimulation paradigm. Uh, and this is for the central median nucleus. Uh, as I said, at sick kids, uh, the, the stimulation uh, use at sick kids is continuous versus we, we, we don't use uh, cycling. Um, again, using connectivity uh, as a potential marker, um, but this is done in uh, post-DBS patients. Again, the bottom line for, for these is that, you know, patients with whose EEG or you know, connectivity study is closer to control or normal patient, they are the ones that would uh, that tend to be uh, uh, have improvement, uh, significant improve or better responders for, for DBS. So now we're getting to the final few slides. We have these three devices and here we have the pros and cons. So if a patient, if you want to go with the least invasive device, VNS will be you know, the, 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 the device that you would choose. Um, the advantage of that um, is that also um, it's, again, it's less invasive um, and also it is now a closed loop system because we're using, you know, most centers are using the Centiva or Aspire um, uh, SR, which has the automatic stimulation. Uh, and also there's the advantage of using the magnet to give extra stimulation if needed, okay? Um, um, it has the longest track record. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of publication in a prospective way uh, with long-term outcomes, okay, as I, I've mentioned earlier. Um, but um, the, the thing with the uh, VNS um, is that um, the advantage, uh, again, is that um, also it's a little bit simpler to, to uh, program and so there are, you don't really need the patient to be followed in a, an epilepsy center. Uh, eventually, they can follow with some of the community neurologists who are comfortable or who have been trained uh, to do VNS um, uh, adjustment. Now, if you want to go to a, a more um, uh, invasive um, uh, stimulation, um, you have DBS and RNS. 
Now, DBS, um, the FDA approval um, is, um, uh, and most of the publication is more for the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, and now more and more data coming up for the central median nucleus of the thalamus. You can, you have to be a little bit more selective. So patients with more temporal lobe type of epilepsy, you would want to use uh, the anterior nucleus of the thalamus as your target versus those with lenox gastro or poorly um, uh, localizable um, uh, targets, then you, you would use the central median nucleus of the thalamus. Um, the stimulation um, uh, adjustment is a little bit more complex compared to VNS. And now with the brain sense, um, right now we still don't know what to do with that, but there are, like for example, in George Ibrahim's lab, uh, they are really collecting all these data, hopefully using that to help with dosing adjustment in the future. Uh, and maybe potentially the new, newer device in the future will make DBS a closed loop device if they know what to do with the brain sense um, uh, technology. Um, and with RNS, unfortunately, this is still not available in Canada, but patients who have one to two foci um, of, of, um, uh, uh, of um, um, seizure onset, you can use RNS. Um, and uh, again, it seems like between DBS and RNS, it, they're quite comparable. And actually, there, there are some papers. So, so this is just, uh, I, I mentioned about this uh, meta-analysis by the ILAE, um, looking at all these perspective and randomized controlled trials. Uh, again, they use only adult patients because they want to compare kind of similar group of patients, okay? Um, so here are the long-term um, uh, follow-up and long-term outcomes. Um, uh, VNS has, uh, there are a lot of papers out there uh, talking about, you know, like the uh, financially, how it improved um, um, healthcare spending uh, for patients. Uh, whereas RNS and, and DBS, the, the, the long-term seizure reduction uh, outcomes are, are much you can see it is much better compared to uh, to VNS, but because it's much more localized stimulation. Okay, um, potential advantages, disadvantages. I already kind of mentioned briefly when I was talking uh, uh, about uh, the devices earlier, uh, but um, basically, you know. Um, it's hard to compare apples to oranges, but this is a, a nice paper that was comparing um, DBS and RNS for the same target, anterior nucleus of the thalamus. And what they've shown is actually the, the um, percentage of decrease in, 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 in uh, seizures is about the same for both. So even though we don't have RNS yet, we could still use um, DBS because um, actually, if we are at least dealing with similar uh, patient population, we can um, get pretty similar uh, seizure outcome. And same thing, uh, this is um, comparing uh, a DBS and RNS in children with drug-resistant epilepsy. Again, the outcome um, is actually quite similar for both, again, you know, if you're talking about uh, kind of similar patients. But again, if you uh, were to look at um, uh, DBS, most of the patients actually had the central median nucleus of the thalamus. There are a few papers or case reports out there now showing uh, combination therapy. So these are patients who had VNS before and then got DBS or RNS. And what happened is when the VNS battery died or got depleted, there was a worsening of the seizure until the VNS was replaced. So kind of let you wonder that hmm, maybe combination therapy can also be um, uh, considered. So this is just an algorithm that I, 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 I would like to show. And it, I mean, you could kind of take home message is that, you know, patients with generalized type of seizure or non-localizable uh, seizures, especially if um, uh, parents don't want to have um, invasive um, type of uh, stimulation, you can consider VNS. If they're local, non-localizable, but maybe focal, you can um, uh, use VNS or DBS, maybe leaning more towards DBS if you have a clear target, for example, temporal lobe epilepsy. So you can go uh, A and T. Um, and then those who are highly localized, then you have the option between um, V and, um, well, the three options, depending on patient preference and also, you know, what, what um, your center um, uh, has available. So all three can be used. 
So in, in summary, so near modulation is a safe and potentially effective option for adult and pediatric patients with drug-resistant epilepsy who are not candidates for resective or ablative uh, surgery. Um, again, you have to choose your targets, and maybe there are some patients who might respond better to certain uh, uh, stimulation uh, uh, um, device. Uh, but you could also consider um, uh, combination therapy, just as we do that with our patients with drug-resistant epilepsy with medication. We also do combination therapy. Potentially, that can also be considered in our patient population. And we still need a lot of research uh, to know biomarkers, hopefully pre-implantation biomarkers, uh, because these devices are expensive, um, and also they're not without side effects. Uh, and, and also, you know, it, 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 they are fairly invasive because they are surgically implanted. Uh, and with that, I end my um, presentation and I'll welcome some questions. Esther, we, we cannot hear you, Esther. Oh,